Hi, I'm Tony Khan. I'm the owner, chairman, president, CEO, founder, booker, head of creative, and a few other things for All Elite Wrestling, AEW. It's a pro wrestling company that I founded in 2019. We have a very inclusive company, and we also have uh, the first ever transgender world champion, Nyla Rose, was the women's world champion, and have done our best in a short time to try and build the most diverse roster we can. We'll also try to feature the biggest names we can find. I started watching wrestling when I was really young. I'm like a childhood wrestling fan, and uh, it's just my favorite thing. And uh, I've always uh, thought about it when I daydreamed and uh, you know put together wrestling cards since I was a pretty small kid. And it's been my favorite hobby thing, you know, since I was uh, probably eight, seven years old. And I watch wrestling on TV as much as I could. It's it's uh, as long as I've really watched TV. It's been my favorite thing. And uh, even working in sports all these years, I would try to make time to watch wrestling when I could, uh, you know, it, at nights. It was like my one uh, hobby when I wasn't working in football. It's funny how I first started watching wrestling because the people who got me into wrestling weren't necessarily my favorite wrestlers once I actually started watching wrestling. Uh, I watched uh, other shows at first, like, you know, as I, I was a TV kid. I had a TV in my room and uh, my, we had a satellite dish at my house and I had like one of those satellite guides and I knew how to point the satellite when I was like four years old at Westcom 4 and SATCOM 6 and find all kinds of stuff. And uh, so I watched the A-Team and uh, Hulk Hogan played himself on the A-Team. He was Hulk Hogan, the wrestler on the A-Team. So that was pretty cool, but I didn't know that was a real person. I just thought that was a guy on TV at first. And then I watched G.I. Joe, and the host of G.I. Joe was Sergeant Slaughter. And again, like, he was the only person that wasn't a cartoon, but I didn't know he was a, a wrestler at first. And then I saw ads for wrestling, and Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter were part of the WWF. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then I watched more of it, and I found myself being probably more compelled by what was actually going on at the time with Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior. And so that was probably the, the storyline that got me hooked. And then uh, Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth were a big part of my wrestling fandom. And uh, not long after that, I started watching uh, WCW also. And uh, it really, I'd heard a lot about Sting and I wanted to see him. And then I finally saw Sting because my friends told me like, forget about Hulk Hogan, Sting is better. And, and I hadn't seen him and then I saw Sting and that was when I was eight years old, and uh, I've never looked back in the last 30 years of being a huge fan. I'd always dreamed of starting a wrestling company, but there was actually a very viable business case and reasons to do so in 2018. The media rights for wrestling television had gone very high, and I think they're gonna continue to rise because wrestling is so strong in the marketplace right now on TV. So uh, there was a really big demand for wrestling TV, and actually, uh, at the time we started up, when I started working on this in 2018, the contracts we knew were gonna fetch hundreds of millions of dollars in guarantees. And so it begged the question, you know, sh would there be space for a competitive wrestling product that could also demand big rights fees on television? I thought so, yes. Also, you'd have great income from pay-per-view and merchandising and all these other opportunities with live events. But really, to me, instead of having a big touring model and people you know, wrestling hundreds of times a year, to me, the bread and butter was going to be the TV product. So I thought this was going to be a really unique time, and I happened to be good friends with Kevin Riley, who at the time was president of TNT and TBS. And he introduced me to the team there, and really, uh, they put us through the ringer big time uh, before they signed up for this. And uh, I started at the ground level with all their business development people doing meetings with like 20, 30 people in the room analyzing whether this was going to be viable. And then we'd have these big meetings and still I really didn't have a contract or anything for a long time. Eventually we did get a TV contract that did give us a six figure allocation per week, but it wasn't nearly the cost of producing the show. So I took a big risk uh, right out of the gate with no TV contract as I started to uh, lock up honestly, millions and millions of dollars in guarantees to sign up wrestlers for multi-year deals. And uh, there was a unique opportunity at the time in the marketplace because there were a lot of great wrestlers who were not under contract at the start of 2019. 
in 2019, wrestling TV rights were gonna kick up big time and there was gonna be uh, big spikes in those numbers. So I thought it would be the perfect time really in 2019 to launch a company. So really in 2018, I was thinking strategically planning ahead uh, and did all, a lot of the legwork um, and tried to build the, the TV uh, contract, but didn't actually have anything in place until t 2019. And even then, what we worked on in 2019 wasn't going to be viable in the long term. It, we had to really go out and prove ourselves, and we did. We did really good numbers uh, immediately. And once we proved we could establish ourselves and then continue and maintain those really strong numbers, we received a $175 million contract from TNT, and uh, you know that gave us uh, you know, a lot of security and it's really been uh, a strong source of revenue, but also through the pandemic, that was really uh, what, what kept us going in a lot of ways without the live event revenue coming in because we, we were the number one wrestling touring company in the world in 2019 on a per show basis. Uh, we had the highest average number of paid fans per show of anyone. And then in 2020, you go to having at first no paid fans. And uh, I tried to be the first to bring fans back to the live event experience, uh, but still, you know, at 25% capacity and everyone physically distanced and uh, in the outdoor space and everyone masked, it was, it was great and it was the safest way to go to a wrestling show. Um, I was really almost trying to create the experience that the drive-in movie last summer uh, really had replaced in 2020 uh, going in, sitting indoors, and that's what I tried to do at Daly's Place with an outdoor amphitheater, and we did it, and we had uh, you know, months and months of shows with no known transmissions and really people feeling very safe outdoor at the shows. It was great, but I think it was also huge to be able to go back and get the fans back from, uh, a, from certainly from a fan standpoint and from an enjoying the show standpoint, but also business-wise. I mean, the ratings picked up because I think the shows are more fun with the fans there and also that live event revenue is great and we've been doing uh, fantastic with our live tours. I tried to never have wrestling without a f any fan reaction. There was always some fan reaction, even if we never had fans. Uh, what I did immediately was use the wrestlers that weren't in active matches and have everyone sit around the ring, and I split everyone up into you know, baby face and heel, or what you might say, the good people and the bad people. And the, that was really effective, I think. And even though it wasn't as great as a packed arena, and it's not, e not even close to a packed arena, honestly, uh, it was a lot better than having nothing. And at the time, our competition was really just doing the show in an empty building. And it, we showed people, I think, that with a small group of people around ringside, you can still get a good percentage of the utility of having fans. And so I, I used our own wrestlers, and then quickly I realized there's a lot of out-of-work independent wrestlers out there that just weren't working. There were no shows, and really uh, AEW and WWE were the only two places that were running at all and because of our two TV contracts. So as I continued to do shows, I saw it as a unique opportunity to give work to a bunch of the young independent wrestlers and then also have them sit around the ring as extras effectively so we had a crowd and then I had all these people there and I had the amphitheater that we, we controlled and there was nobody else booking shows at the time. So for months we would do tryout matches, effectively developmental enhancements and really found a lot of great talent that way. People that came in for tryouts and we got to know them and it was win-win because a lot of our stars got exposure and built up their records and uh, had developed good win-loss records. And then when they showed up on TNT on Wednesday nights, they were going in with, uh, uh, suddenly they had a, a five match winning streak because maybe they had gone out and wrestled five developmental wrestlers since the last time they appeared on television. And we really, uh, found some, some strong talent that way. For example, Will Hobbs, Red Velvet, each of the acclaimed separately, Max Caster and Anthony Bowens, I packaged them together as a team. Um, and the Varsity Blondes, same thing, Brian Pillman and Griff Garrison were working on Dark. And a lot of other uh, successful acts for us have, have come in that way. So it's, it's been a great vehicle and I think, uh, I, I never wanted to do the shows without the fans, I guess my point. but. It made it for the best possible viewing experience in the pandemic, what we did. We established ourselves when I went out and signed a lot of free agents. And in January 2019, Chris Jericho, the Young Bucks, and Cody Rhodes were the best free agents I could sign. And then a month later, Kenny Omega became available. And there was a lot of 
great wrestling talent on the independents. Uh, people I was really interested in at the beginning, MJF, Jungle Boy and Sammy Guevara were young prospects. The Young Bucks had uh, brought Jungle Boy's name in and Chris Jericho mentioned Sammy Guevara. And uh, there were a bunch of people pushing young Darby Allen on me. And there have been a lot of, uh, you know, young wrestlers that we've established along the way, but there's also been a lot of free agents. And that's how we tried to build the company from the beginning as a mix of those things. And I've tried to keep it steady with that same mix. So it's very important to me to keep uh, scouting and trying to sign uh, top talent, both young people to develop and people for the future. And I think there's no better examples of that than for, you know, CM Punk wrestling Darby Allen in his first match at AEW All Out and it was so well received. And then of course, CM Punk in his TV debut match wrestling Powerhouse Hobbs, who is somebody who really came in from the ground up in AEW and worked his way up through AEW Dark and, and then has become a, an important main event player on AEW television. There's so much interest in the business of wrestling because uh, that fans know that's such a driver of success and a lot of ways look at a wrestler and they say how the greatest measure of their career was how much money did they draw and I think that's a big part of it. I think you want to be safe and a legacy of safety and, and being a good person is really important too. So you know those I would put near the top you know how, the, how that person conducted themselves in their life and also were they a safe person to, to, to work with. But also uh, I would say that how much money somebody's drawn is a really important thing to quantify. So that's, again, there's a lot of wrestling fans really care about business metrics like TV ratings and live events and, you know, gates and pay-per-view viewership. People hang their hats on these things. And it's like if you're a fan of a sports team, you're interested in the statistics of the team. And the simplest statistic is wins and losses and points scored and points allowed. But really then people start looking at individual statistics and and I don't think it's unusual. I think it's part of wrestling fandom. And it's a lot of what people call tribalism in wrestling, I do recognize as like fandom and being somebody who's working in a as a football executive, both in the NFL and in England, it's important to me to make that distinction because I think a lot of people are just doing what's natural to them, being like good fans of their brand, in this case, and their, their team. So it just so happens that AEW has a big band of fans and, and as a team we happen to be very well supported. The reason that no other wrestling company in the last few decades has had the foothold we've had is in my opinion twofold and it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Uh, we've had the great exposure with the big TV contract that gives us great legitimacy and also gives us great penetration. So. It's a very easy show to find, and it feels like a big event every Wednesday. And because we have this partnership with TNT and Warner Media, and went with such a powerful media partner, it makes us feel more legitimate, which brings me to my other point. None of the other wrestling companies that have come along in the last 20 years actually felt like a legitimate competitor, a real thing. They felt like fun, niche wrestling products. And if you're a big wrestling fan, they're things you might watch. But they're not going to take households by storm. They weren't things that were going to win the night on TV. They, you know, they might, on their night, get some wrestling fans to watch their show, but there hasn't been anything in wrestling that's come along in two decades that would be competitive. Uh, in terms of a second national wrestling company where it could stand to be the number one show on cable in its night or even a top five show. There's nothing really like that's been like that. And people compare numbers from the past and say, you know, 15 years ago, other wrestling companies that, that came along as startups were doing big TV audiences. And what I would say to that is the TV audience was very different as a whole back then. And it was, you know, there was more viewership and in the demo, and in terms of demo ratings, there really hasn't been anything like what we're doing in, in terms of competing head-to-head -head with WWE week to week in the cable ratings in t t two decades. And uh, you know, another point I would make is while other wrestling companies have had good viewership in that time, it's been a long time since that. And nobody's had any viewership like ours in over a decade. Then. The other point is 
converting that audience to pay-per-view buyers. Nobody has been able to do that at the clip we've done it since WCW was in their heyday and really uh, the pay-per-view market has changed. And this is all you know, now a head-to-head two-team competition in many ways. So it is the most uh, focused, I think the fans have been on a head-to-head competition in a long time because there haven't been two companies that were able to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue since the late 90s. So when we started AW Dynamite in October 2019, I had never officially written a wrestling TV show. All of my experience writing TV shows and wrestling had been exclusively imaginary. And all the episodes of Dynamite and Rampage for that matter were shows that I had been creating at home, like in, in for fun, as a hobby. And when it came to practical TV writing experience, I didn't have it. So I did lean more on people around me. And I would try to trust my instincts, but it's hard when you don't have as much experience. And I do take a lot of pride in, in the booking. I work with a lot of really smart people. And what I think I do a good job of is being organized, dealing with a lot of different people and going for ideas. You know, I have a lot of great creative minds that are in the company that I can have full-time access to. like. Chris Jericho and Christian Cage and John Moxley has great ideas. And now CM Punk and Brian Danielson, Adam Cole have come in with great ideas. So we've got uh, a lot of awesome things happening right now and I'm, I'm proud of that. And I try to keep it all organized and balanced. And I've found it's, it's, it's helped me a lot, you know, writing the shows myself. I don't really understand the idea of having a lot of different people write the show and then a person would go in the day of and rip it to pieces and try to come up with new ideas. And to be honest, when I hear about somebody going in and they have a TV show on Monday that they rip up, my first thought is, what were you doing all weekend? Because that's, I work my ass off on the weekends. And uh, you know I have to come in with a plan for Wednesday and Friday night. And I want to make sure Dynamite's great and Rampage. And so I don't do everything myself, but I do make the final decision on everything. I put the format together. I put an outline of what the show is going to be for Dynamite and Rampage. I write it by hand. And I, I don't understand why you're going to come in and rip up a show that you should have a pretty good idea what it is and you should have approved it where Monday we know what we're doing. And things change on the day of the show. Not that I never change my mind on the day of. I do. but. Uh, not where I'm going to change everything. I might change one or two things around on instinct or, or because something happened, but for the most part, I like to have a good idea of what is going to be on the show next week and the week after. And I, I really believe uh, that the fans like that we try our best not to insult their intelligence. And I, 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 do, I do try to make the show as compelling and also uh, logical. And I think that's also one of the challenges because a lot of times people come to you with ideas uh, and it's hard because like everyone's got their own approaches and their own philosophies, but there's a tone to the show. So I really just want people to go out and make the points and keep the stories going, but I'm not so autocratic that I want to control every word somebody says on television. And I think that's also why some of our interviews, our, our storytelling and promos are really strong, I believe.